And only the Heidelberg Catechism is left, one of three. And even that, you've only got a third of it. For Lord's Day 7 or 8, the Lord's Day is 22 or 23 or 24. Which brought about an irreconcilable division in the consistory with the elders proposing disbanding the church in order to end the witness that there would be no fellowship or anything like that continuing, but that there would be a full stop finished. That was what we were told. We were told we were finished. Because there was nobody left with any ability or money. Maybe that's true. Who knows, but God uses nobodies. We were told that God himself had closed the church. And that in continuing as a fellowship, we were working against the will of God. And so we were sinning. And that there was absolutely no continuity between the Covenant Protestant Reformed Fellowship, which we became, and the Covenant Protestant Reformed Church, which had disbanded. And then rumours were circulated in the time that we were closed down. But of course we were They even tried to have this piece of land in Clarence Street transferred to the PRC. So the PRC in turn would then sell it. And so that we would never be able to erect a church building here. But the Lord brought us back from the grave and healed us. And the people who passed through the disbanding recovered spiritually. God healed us. And some of those who left, for various reasons, returned. And other new people joined. And the Covenant Protestant Reformed Fellowship was reorganized as the Covenant Protestant Reformed Church four years after it disbanded. And we've grown numerically and spiritually since then, though not without struggles. And now we are here in this new building. And I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up, says David, and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. In fact, there was a man not that far from here who owned, or maybe still owns, a house overlooking this piece of land. He didn't mean it with any malice, of course. And there were a couple in our church looking to either buy or rent that house from him. I forget now, it doesn't matter for the story. They looked out the window and saw this piece of waste land. And the owner of the house thinking that if someone were to build on that piece of land that might make his own property a bit less desirable, said, oh, but don't worry. That sat there vacant. There could never be anything there. Don't worry about that. This is a good house you should rent or buy it, whatever. He didn't need it out of malice. He just wanted to sell his house. But it's wrong. Now I mention these things not because of any bitterness or because we want people to be better. That's the last thing we want. <clears throat> but we do need to learn. We need to learn too because some of those who have left us have gone even further astray into the deepest forms of apostasy. Others, thankfully, have shown some signs of grief or sorrow. And others, of course, went away with family members or were too young to know or understand. And we pray for them and we hope good for them. We don't mention these things either because we want to gloat. God hates gloating. It's evil. It grieves the Holy Spirit. But we do need to know and believe that God works all things for good. And that means God works all things for good for us personally and as a congregation. And God works all things for good even in place of our own sins and weaknesses which are many. 
We can say with the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1, the things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. His imprisonment worked for good. Our difficulties were good. That's always the calling of God to us in all our struggles. We keep our heads. We trust in the Lord. That's what David did. On the run for Saul. He wavered once or twice. We have wavered an awful lot more. He thought at one stage it wasn't worth it. He was bound to die. And so he went over to the Philistines. He had to tell lies in a few instances. Although he didn't really have to. He felt he had to. He got himself in such a bind. And even then, after Saul's death, he had another seven years to wait before the promise was fulfilled. And he ruled over all Israel in God's name. So we've got to know too and understand a little of our own history. And be thankful and extol the Lord who lifts us up. And also too that we not fall into the same mistakes and sins again. Listen to David's moving words now in verse 5. His anger endureth but a moment in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. David here refers to his years of humiliation as years in which it felt that God's anger was upon him. Especially because he couldn't go up to public worship with the saints. He didn't know the closeness of the means of grace. He refers to these years as years of weeping. Weeping. And then he adds that in reality, though not literally, but in reality, it was just for a moment. It was only for a night, as it were. And then, in the goodness of God, it was swiftly followed by life and joy. His anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. The Apostle Paul taught us that our light afflictions, which are but for a moment, work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. They're light, they're brief for a moment, and they work an eternal, weighty glory. In the way, and not otherwise, of looking at the invisible things of God by faith. Otherwise, they'll make us better, praise God. That's what we must believe, that the Lord is gracious and good, and He rewards liberally those who trust in Him. The verse 7 changes the imagery a bit. I'm reading the last couple of clauses. <laughs> Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. David is here thinking, in all of my hardships and afflictions, where is God? I can't see Him. It's hard to believe in Him. Although he did. And he understood that the Lord was always there. That God was hiding His face. His face was there, but he couldn't see it because it was hidden. A few years ago, we had a couple of sermons on Psalm 77. God's way is in the sea. You can't see His footsteps. You don't know exactly what He's doing. You cling to the Word believe that, walk obediently and then you will come out the other side. And not only is God's way in the sea, as that psalm says, but his way is in the sanctuary. That it's in the way of his holy righteous dealings with his church. That you understand what he's doing in our lives and in our families. That's God's way. That's how he act. You can't see it all. But it's always holy. And so you persevere. Wait. Trust. 